Right, so in case you're just catching up with us um, and don't know, we're going through a series called Do You Seriously Think God Can't Use You? And the verse that has started all of this is 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. It says this, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let those who boast, boast in the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you just now, Lord, just as, you, as we are with our hearts. Lord, may your word be like a piercing sword through our hearts. May it challenge us when we need challenging. May it comfort us when we need comforting. Lord, we ask that we might hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So that verse is our focus, those verses. Um, you will be hearing a lot about these biblical uh, characters in these weeks, and most of the times um, we won't even be able to read all of the scripture passages of the stories of these guys, but this is our main focus. And as a bit of a background to this, it all started with this photo on the screen. It was in one of those moments um, in my life when I was struggling with some stuff. Um, and, you know, not to say that it's all done and all in the past, you know, it still comes over me sometimes, but I was struggling with some weird thoughts, like I'm sure most of you have struggled with at any given time. I kept feeling, and this was a few good years ago, I kept feeling this feeling of unworthiness and, you know, kept thinking of myself as really being the wrong guy at the wrong time in the wrong country for this, and I was feeling really unqualified. That's the best, most polite term that I could use. And coincidentally or not, side note, you know, I don't believe in coincidences, this came, as I remember, at a time when God was calling me into leadership at Fozil Baptist Church in Coventry, which also came at the same time with the calling of, um, you know, to ministry that God had already had over my life. But it became more powerful from that time on that I couldn't escape it. Don't get me wrong, it was still my choice. I still had to say yes eventually after saying no over a very long time, but it became inescapable. And for some reason, I had this idea until the minister had a word with me. He used to use codes when uh, he was talking. He used to say either come by the manse, we need to have a chat, which uh, meant simply a catch-up and how you're doing. Or he would say, come by the manse, we need to have a word. That's when you knew you were in trouble. And <laughs> if you were to um, ask him today, he wouldn't admit it, but he had to have more words with me rather than chats. And I had this idea that I somehow needed to be something or needed to be good enough and all the other sorts of things and excuses that I was coming up with in order so that I would eventually respond to that call of God. I thought that once I had it all figured out, once I started to feel good enough about myself, that I would be able to take that step into obedience to what God was calling me to do. And man, was I struggling. One of the misconceptions with regards to leadership within a church context is that someone needs to achieve perfection in order to take part in that. But that is nowhere near true. If you know me well enough, and if you know the rest of the leaders well enough, you would know that we are far from perfect. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we're dismissing what the Bible says about what we should look out for when we're choosing our leaders, that we believe God has called them into leadership and all that. Those are specific instructions for that. But that also doesn't mean that you need to achieve perfection and holiness to a level that is above anyone else in church in order to be called to be a leader. We should already know that the only one that is perfect is Jesus Christ. And so, as I was struggling with understanding all that, with processing, with doubting it, I came across this photo. And it blessed me, and it was really encouraging to me, and I really hope it's going to bless you, at least in the same way. And just to put it out there so that no one catches me on plagiarism or anything like that, this was not my original idea. This is not a photo that I came up with. This is something that I came across online. Um, and as far as I know, there were other preachers that, that uh, use it in the past, and they've done this sort of series previously that is similar to what we're doing. But the rest that comes from it such as this sermon and all the others that we pray are God's ideas brought through me and the rest of the speakers. As you notice, there's plenty of big names up there, you know, on the screen, a lot of important figures. But the one thing that is depicted in all of those lines is that, um, you know, is what some of their defects, you know, were. Some of their failings, some of their character flaws and all that. We need to note from the start that the title of the photo is, Do You Seriously Think God Can't Use You? And so we're focusing not on the failure, but on God's amazing power, grace, and mercy to equip the unequipped, you and I, and to use us for His divine purpose, will, and plan. I also need to note from the start that none of these things should be used as an excuse in saying, oh, never mind, God can use me anyway, I'll keep doing what I'm doing, I'll keep sinning, and all of that. I'm not saying that, I'm saying that no matter what you struggle with, whether something in the past that you've done, or has happened to you, or whether you struggle with something now and you don't see a way forward, that God can still use you despite that. And although for many of us, we probably won't be used in the same um, way, you know, in something huge as this guy was. I'm not saying that God won't, but I'm trying to lower your expectation to keep it a bit more realistic. But whatever God will use you for is still important and makes a difference. And although we probably won't be used to part, you know, the Red Sea or do things in the same way, God has done amazing stuff through Moses, despite everything that he was struggling with. For some of you, you probably know the story of Moses in the Bible uh, more than others. I'm not going to stress too much on the whole story, but I think for the context of things, we need to know some stuff about him. And also, many other things that God did through Moses, we won't be looking at that today, but it is worth having a read in your own time of the Old Testament stories. Moses became one of these huge important figures in the Bible, and he was God's tool in freeing God's people, the Israelites, from Egypt. God did many miracles through Moses and used him as a leader to take the Hebrew people through the wilderness in order to reach the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey in which Moses never got to step into. God also used Moses to write some books of the Bible and to give him the plans for building a temple for God and also use him to give a lot of rules and regulations to the Israelites to make sure that they kept themselves pure and separated from the rest of the world, basically. And so Moses was born in Egypt when the Israelites were their slaves. At a point in time, the ruler of Egypt noticed that the Israelites Uh, these are God's people, were multiplying and have become a threat. So in Exodus 1, we find out that the Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, gives his orders to drown into the Nile all the male Hebrew newborn children. But one of them was hid by his mother, and then when he was three months old, he was put in a basket. In a Moses basket, maybe, (laughs) but but never mind, you know, in a basket and into the water so that the Pharaoh's daughter would find him. And they named him Moses, which means draw out or drawn out of the water, obviously. 
Now, this guy Moses grew up as being part of the royal family in the Pharaoh's house, but as he grew up, he went to see his people, the Israelites, and he witnessed an Egyptian uh, beating up a Hebrew. Then Moses, in case you didn't know the story, killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, two Hebrews were fighting and Moses interfered, asking them to stop. But one of them replied, are you going to kill me the same way that you did with the Egyptian? And after this, Moses fled the country because he knew that gossip is a powerful tool. And what he did has now become known. And so Moses ends up in Midian, and after a courageous fight with some shepherds that were picking up on some girls, he ended up married to Zephora, one of the girls that he rescued. And in case it isn't clear enough, back then, in that context, all that Moses did was saving these seven girls from some rude shepherds. Then their father has, you know, him to come over and have something to eat as a reward, he even gives Moses one of his daughters in the end to marry him. Nowadays, there's nowhere near enough work that you have to put in so that you can get married. Nowhere near. And this is serious stuff, and I mean it. I have two daughters. If you've got any sons or grandkids and think that just because they stand up for my girls one day to defend them um, and then I'll give you something to eat, you know, and then my daughter to marry you, you definitely don't know me that well. But this is what happened then in this story. And so after some time spent there getting used to the outdoors and taking care of his father's in-law's flocks in Exodus 3, Moses has an incredible encounter with a strange bush that was on fire, but wasn't consumed. This event is is significant because God speaks to someone for the first time and he introduces himself as I am by his name. God presents himself as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses knew that story, and then God presents himself to Moses by giving examples to him, illustrations of the times when he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and provided for them all that they needed. Just as now, God presents Moses and his mission, and he encourages him to trust in the God who is enough, the great I am, who has enough and who provides enough so that the mission would be successful. This is a reminder for Moses and us today even to know that this is the same God, Yahweh, who has done it all before and who will do it again. The God that calls you into the unknown overcomes impossible odds to keep his promises and takes the unpromising material of our lives and all our insufficiency and transforms it. This episode is significant to us also because at any given time in the life of a Christian, we come to this pivotal moment where we are faced with making a decision. And the decision is this. Am I going to listen to and follow this God that has just revealed himself to me? Am I going to be the one that says, here I am, Lord, send me? Or am I not? In Moses' context, this God reveals himself to him by the means of a burning bush. In our context, this God reveals himself to us by the means of the revelation that comes through Jesus Christ, the conviction through the Holy Spirit. This episode is significant because Moses goes ahead and does what most of us do when we are faced with the call of God over our lives, maybe. And this is not by any means the call to ministry that I'm talking about, but it is the calling of all believers and the belief in the priesthood of all believers. We see Moses doing what most of us do, and that is that we try to back out and give God all sorts of reasons why we don't think it's such a good idea to follow him. And our usual excuses that we come up with are mainly based on our past failures our past mistakes, not even, uh, or, you know, some of the stuff maybe that we think of that we're not as good as, such as speaking. I wonder if you've ever been in that situation where you said, Lord, anyone else but me, please, sir, anyone else, send someone else. This was Moses. 
That's why we get all these human examples in the Bible, in case you ever wondered, to encourage us that they were only human. But God used them mightily despite of their flaws. Now again, this is not an excuse for us to sin because God will use me anyway. But this is an encouragement that God will use you despite anything that you might come up with. Look at Moses. God introduces himself as a God of compassion. He hears his people cry. He tells him his name. He shows his power. Tells Moses how he's going to rescue the Israelites. And Moses says, please pick someone else. But you see, the important moment in this story is not that God displays his power, will, or that he's going to do it. But it's the fact that he is going to use Moses. He says, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. Now, it's important that we understand at this stage, before we go any further, that the great Yahweh, the great I am, does not need anyone to do anything. His simple presence in the midst of the Egyptians, his authority would have been enough. He doesn't need you and I in order to do something, but we should be humbled and honored that he chooses to do so by using us. God can do it all by himself. And this is a good reminder for us. He brought everything into existence or he could have chosen someone else like we see later with Joshua. He didn't need Moses, but he chose Moses. It's not the other way around that we use God in order to achieve our purpose and that without us, God cannot do it. It is knowing that our lives are a mere smoke or cloud compared to the eternality of the living God that we serve. And yet we pick up a fight with God and we don't like it when he doesn't answer to our prayers the way that we wanted him to. And we make out a prayer, a habit of actually being very specific With what we want God to do for us. And how we want him to deliver. I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone here today. But have you ever been in that situation? I know for sure I have. In verse 11, Moses says to God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? But God says, I will be with you. God says, don't worry about who you are. That's not that important. Don't worry about what you've done. That's not important. Don't worry about your speech. That's not important. Just know that I'll be with you. And every time we try to back out of situations, every time we try to find reasoning to not want to walk into the will of God for our lives, God just has a way of turning things around and telling us, I am still in control. And no matter what your thoughts are, my plan is better. You see, because God knows the end from the beginning, and because of that, He will, and and His will, and, and His planning always takes us to better, even when we experience hardship. I think we need to go back to that place of surrender that even Jesus was experiencing and say to God in all situations, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And so Moses in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, he simply does what most of us don't admit we do, right? He bargains with God, tries to get out of it, and could find a whole list of reasons why why he's not qualified for the job. You see, God gives Moses a purpose to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians. Don't forget, God gave you a purpose as well, as an individual and as a church. And by working alongside with him, you discover more of that. But God gives Moses a name to present to the Israelites when he goes. And tells him, tell them that God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Not only that, but God also gives him the power to do miracles. After Moses says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't really appear to you? God did that in order so that Moses would be able to prove to them 
that he was in fact sent by God. And yet after all that, this is what Moses says. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Some of the excuses we come with, if you'd like, some of the reasons we come up with for God not to use us, or some of the obstacles we see in some of the things we can't do properly or don't know how to do properly can stop us from truly trusting in God as well. I know myself, and there are areas that I don't like. But you see, the problem is not that we know that and we can't operate in it. The problem is not trusting that God can do it. And it's all about perception at the end of the day. You see, you can be easily tricked into thinking that this story, the same as many other stories in the Bible, is actually about this main character called Moses, who did all these wonderful, miraculous things. But in fact, it's a story that talks about the awesome power of God and his ability to use people and to work through people that not only others see as unqualified, but even they themselves see themselves as unqualified. This is the case for us as well. We can easily get carried away and think that we are the main character of the story when in fact we're not. That's why certain puny arguments really aren't that important. That's why certain opinions or who's right or who's wrong at the end of the day doesn't really matter because it's not your story. It's not my story. We're not the main character. Thanks God for that. The main character is God and his mission to bring this whole creation to salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we are just part of it. The same as Moses had a part of it. On this time around, when I read and stayed in the passage, I saw something different. On a previous occasion, I saw Moses as talking back to God, you know. I saw Moses having an argument with God. But on this occasion, on this occasion, I saw something else. I saw a man with a huge insecurity. I saw a guy with a past that he was running away from. In a sense, you know how Peter told Jesus, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. I saw a man that brought stuff to God and asked him to use someone else. Because he was in a position that we find ourselves at times as well. He was not only thinking of himself, oh, I'm not good at this. He was saying, what if others see that I'm not good at this. What will I do then? When they see that I actually stutter and I'm not eloquent and I jump from one foot to another and I'm nervous and all of that. God, what if one day when I wake up and forget to put my mask on, that mask called confidence, like no one can touch me, like I'm invincible. What if someone sees me then? What if a stutter slips in? What if something else happens and they notice it? What if they see me for the real me, the scared me, the weak me? And this is when things change in our lives and the way that we see things. This is where our attitudes changes as well. It's when we realize that God is actually in charge. He is the one that gives us everything that we need to do the job. He is the one that equips and uses those that see themselves as unusable. It's something that I do sometimes, something that I know most of you do at times, something that Moses did, and it's this. Pardon your servant, Lord. Pick someone else. I'm not qualified enough. I don't know a lot of things about a lot of things. And some mornings, I wake up feeling it in my body. But one thing I know, 
that God does not look for qualified people or for people that are enough or that think themselves as being enough. He takes those that are unqualified and qualifies them. This is the story of Moses and many others in the Bible, and this is your story as well. That God, the one that is I am, is sufficient for any role or duty. And you need to always remember this and keep going back to it. That you and I are never going to be enough or have enough if we rely on our own strengths. Especially in today's world. <coughs> but if we rely on the one who called us, the great I am, we need to know that he will also sustain us. And the one who called uh, and used Moses despite of anything that he thought he couldn't be is the same God, Yahweh, that is calling you today. Telling you, I can use you not because of who you are, but because of who I am. I am who I am. So if you struggle with English, if it's not your first language, although for many of you that's not a problem, and if you find it difficult in using it, or you have a speech impairment, or you have stage fright, or anything like that, think of Moses and what God told him. What did God tell Moses? He said, who gave human beings their mouths? Who made them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. God uses Moses despite of all that he thought he couldn't be. And all the excuses that he came up with and by God being who he is, he helped Moses be who he was and do what he did in order to accomplish his mission and lead the Israelites. And I think this is a good, strong reminder for all of us today that God is the one that does all things through us. He is the one that enables and empowers, and without his help, we can do nothing. The one who called you will use you with all that you have and all that you haven't got. Because guess what? He knows about you. He knows all of that about you because he created you that way. And you are perfect the way that God created you. If you wanted you to be someone else, he would have created you someone else. The God who called you will also make you be enough and have enough for the job he is calling you to do. Whatever that might look like. You are enough because he is enough. If he could use someone like Moses... He can definitely use someone like you. Always remember that the one who enables, the one that encourages, the one that gives strength, the one that provides, the one that sustains, and always remember that the one that does all those things, it's not you, it's not me, but it's our God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.